Hey everybody, Shannon Bryant, Virtual and Blended Learning Coordinator, Keller ISD. This video is all about how to design lessons and Nearpod. So our agenda is first we're going to look at lesson design, but when you do that, you also might want to consider student pace and how you're going to grade things. The goals I have for each piece, so there are questions that I ask myself along the way, and they'll work for anybody. Don't think you have to have one slide per question. Each question might have a myriad of things that you put together. These are the Nearpod tools that I like to use to get students' attention. The tool Nearpod 3D allows a kid to have an image that they're able to move around and look at it from all sides. Well, you don't just want a kid to do that. You're going to have to give them something to do when they they are discovering it and you can't see them moving that snail or skeleton or mountain around so I would include a task to do like write down three things you noticed and three things that you wondered or whatever other question you want to give them and then follow up that 3d activity with a collaboration board where they can share those thoughts with the group another one that you're not going to be able to see them doing anything with is the BBC videos the videos are great. I encourage you to check them out, but you won't see the kid interacting with that video. Let's say you use one of their videos or upload a video you've created or found on YouTube. That you can make interactive where you can see. In EarPod now, just like with Edpuzzle, you can put questions along the way, both multiple choice and open-ended, so you're able to see and have a piece of accountability informatively assess. I love the time to climb. It's a great way to start a lesson if you taught something the previous day that you need them to recall to use to learn this new information you're going to share with them today. So the time to climb, it's like a quiz but made into a game. So it's a really great way to, to pre-assess where they're at or remind them of where they need to be. I also like to use the polling feature just to see how they're feeling that day or how they feel about this concept they're, they're about to learn. And then web tool is awesome because you can put anything in there any link. So maybe you have a website that you like to use a lot. Uh, virtual manipulatives are great maybe to show there. Now the memory test is matching the same text or matching the same picture. So let's say you just have a lot of images you want kids to see to get excited about what they're about to learn or make them start thinking about it. Those images could go in a memory test. The audio is just going to be that. So you could play music, you could have yourself talking. It, all they're going to be doing is listening to it, so you might want to have them write down things. So you got them excited about it, but then what are you going to use to get them to discover that concept? Because we know if they discover, they're more likely to remember it. I like to use the draw tool, and this works with any content. You make a series of draw tools that are different questions that you're going to ask. Your last question is where you want them to be by the time they finish this discovery activity. So it's that question you would use to assess if they're there. And then you work backwards and say, okay, what do I need you to do before you can do this? That's the question before that one. And what do I need you to do before you can do this? That's the question before that one and so on and so forth until you get a question that they should be able to come in and naturally do. I have a whole video on how to just do a whole Nearpod with questions and I'll link that below. You could do a matching game. So let's say you have a card sort that was a matching game you would normally do in class. You can create that same thing digitally here. Field trip. I love this idea. I heard a gentleman talking about how he teaches his automotive class virtually and one of his objectives is that kids have to know how, uh, what is the appropriate way to clean up a garage, how it should look. It has to have certain criteria. So he took a 360 video of the his garage set up correctly, and then he messed it up or had some kids mess it up, and took that video again, and they compared and contrast those two. That is a great way to get kids to discover something, giving them two that they can create a Venn diagram on a, a drawing 
draw using the draw tool fill in the blank is another good discovery because it's self-checking so you can tell when you put the words in the right place just by them being nouns or adverbs and then you can figure out the thing that you needed to discover so that's another good one I like the PDF viewer if you're wanting to give students text to read in order to discover and you can also use the draw tool by taking that long reading and making several little draw boards that way you're able to see if you want them to highlight or question the text or mark up the text in any way graphing calculators great for math just like manipulatives are that's why I put another web content because of course virtual manipulatives and then sway is kind of reminds me of little teaching uh, almost like websites so it would have all of the things about your concept on one website it might be video text to read surveys to take whatever by topic I didn't see a whole lot of math in there but there's look like there are great things for uh, uh, English language arts social studies and science so check out sway the FET simulator you're not going to be able to see what they do so you want to make sure that they have to record or write down something how are you going to know that they understood what they need to understand from the discovery so you want to plan for that so you're able to assess oh these kids are ready to go work well this is the group that I need to keep behind and have a mini lesson and you can do that remotely you can do it in a breakout room or you can just let the class that's ready to go log off and those that you want to work with some more stay there with you a uh, collaborate board that's another way so with the collaborate board you would put a, a prompt that that was the thing they needed to be able to that was the question that they needed to be able to answer by the time they finished that discovery activity great with the collaboration board they can see each other's response and like those so they can learn from each other remember you can do that with the draw tool as well because you're able to share their boards and then they can learn from each other that way I have a really good video on how to use comments and when you use that comments with those questions build really good relationships okay any way that I can assess so I could use a quiz I could use a uh, web content to see if they understood it maybe it's a link to a quizzes maybe it is um, a Google form or a Google Doc that they're gonna do something on it any of those things you can use and then open-ended questions don't forget you can have kids record their audio their answer to their question oh and Flipgrid that's a wonderful way to see if they discovered what they should they can make a video great for if you need them to perform or present or do something like that to assess how will they apply this new information I've given you some different options I like to use Google Slides for this because again it might be a project or task that I'm going to give them but I can also uh, use Google Forms um, any other of the Google Suite tools. I can use draw tools. Really, this is just a deeper assessment. I could use the Flipgrid open question quizzes or web content because it is them creating something, it is them being assessed. This is probably where you're going to get your grade, but I'm not going to hold you to that because I'm going to give you some other options too. But here's the big one. What are you going to do when they're wrong? I like to do that little list that you see there for every slide that I have. So in the notes section, of my uh, Google Slides. I started doing this just recently and it really did help. In the notes section, I'll look at that slide and think about what they have to do there and list my misconception along with what's a great question that I'm going to ask or a hint or maybe an example which you can get from the other kids board or a resource, a link that I might want to give them. And I just put that in the notes section. That way if it does happen in class, I have the presentation open and I can just copy paste. It also also makes you think through those things before you are in the heat of battle and you can't remember them you know think about what are you going to do when they're right you don't want kids so bored and you see that they've gotten everything correct on the bo their board and you're always using their board as the example let them feel of the value that they bring to that class okay so give them a task to do when they're done and let the whole class know you're always supposed to be doing something in here so one of the things I like to say is hey this is a great time if you're finished go fill in your notes you put in a really good example there 
put that example in your notes. Maybe list out the steps, something big that you've learned. Or I can private message them a follow-up question. Hey, I see a lot of you are already finished. This is the time you go grab a drink of water or go to the restroom, right? You don't want them missing out on the instruction. And then this is the most important thing. Praise. Specific praise. Make that work for you. It works for you in so many ways. One thing, when you choose a kid's work to show as an example that this is what you were looking for or have them explain it because it's just mind-blowing that they thought of that and you didn't. Yeah. You build their confidence and you create a community in your class. You are building relationships without having to stop teaching content when you do that. And kids will want to come to your classroom because it feels like a positive place to be. Make it work for you by using their examples. Hey, this is what I'm looking for when I'm look, I'm, I'm looking at your looking for good work. We tell kids show your work or show your thinking, but a lot of kids need to see what that looks like or what do you want that to look like. So pulling up different boards lets them see a whole lot of different ideas instead of always yours. I do want to throw this little tip out there though. I learned that if I'll join the Nearpods like a student, I can, with my phone or with my iPad, I can be that example and I'm not seeing it. Or I can give them resources that way too. Okay, so when those kids get it right, how are you going to showcase that? Remember, praise, specific praise, you can make that work for you in other ways as well. I have taken students' boards, maybe it's something that they did on their own, and I'll use their examples in future lessons. Maybe there are questions on the time to climb, or questions to get them thinking on other boards, or sample data. I've done it that way too, where they had to collect data on a Nearpod, and then I took their sample data and we used it in class. Mainly because it doesn't depend on everybody doing that, right? We just needed that sample. But also to make it work for me. I don't want to have to be making every video, me making every example. Let your kids do that. They get a sense of pride. I know that I have kids now that will private message me. Hey, show my board. Show my board. My board's really good. Oh, look, you just showed my board. Thank you so much. That Look at my board. Check it out. They get excited when they see that you value what they do. Sometimes they don't want everybody to know that, but they'll private message you. And then give them the kudos. I've had uh, students come up with some way to solve something that I hadn't even ever thought of before or a question that I hadn't even never thought of before. And I give them the props for that. Hey, you you kind of beat the teacher here. That's pretty good. And letting them have the spotlight, even if it means you were wrong about something or, or didn't think of everything. That's another way you build community. When you have your lesson design, like we talked about before, then you want to go to, uh, do you want this to be a self-paced lesson? I encourage you to design every lesson so it's self paced and here's why. It might not be that you use it in class that way, but I can tell you it makes your class go really smooth when you do because you're not having to fumble and grab examples. It's all right there. You also always have a backup if you're absent. Uh, if a kid was absent, uh, if a kid was sick, or maybe they just need to see that material one more time. So I really do encourage you to make sure all of your near pods have the potential to be self-paced Nearpods. And here's how you do it. First, go through and narrate. I'm not talking literally write down everything you would say in class. and nobody got time to do that. What I'm saying is, go through and think about what you would say in class of value that is missing from that board. And how could you add that? Maybe it's even just an extra slide. Or one time I realized in the lesson, oh, I demonstrated this thing that only the kids who were in class it's not like I had a video of me doing it. What I did was I went to YouTube and I found a video of exactly what I was looking for and I just linked that into the presentation. That way everybody gets the same type of experience. And it doesn't always have to be a video. It can literally be a couple of words added to the slide or maybe even another activity you need them to do first. The next thing is self-assessing. You have to decide for the purpose of the Nearpod you're creating, do you want it to be self-assessing? 
assessing. So here's some things to consider. If students are supposed to learn from the materials you've given them, you want to be able to make sure that they can check for their own understanding. So I'm thinking with math, you've got a problem. You've got an answer with the problem worked out. You get the idea. You can also have a video of that. Uh, it could be a checklist where they can check their assignment. Uh, it could be some type of reveal. Maybe that's in a video or in an image. But if you are making this nearby to be a quiz or a test, you might not want to make it self-assessing. The reason that's important is if it's student-paced, they need to be able to truly walk away having learned the material from it. Now, maybe you don't want them to get that material until you reveal it on another Nearpod, and that's totally fine too. Make sure that your directions are clear. Could somebody else, given this Nearpod, do that self-paced thing and walk away having done everything you wanted them to do? For example, maybe you want them to take a screenshot of just one of the slides and turn that in because that's all you're going to grade on. Those directions need to be in there. Or maybe at the end, on the last slide, you want to tell them somewhere else to go and something else to do. And finally, reminders. So you have to remember that you put these in there because year after year, those reminders would probably change. But then your part is a great place for you to say, hey, tomorrow we've got a quiz or a test, or don't forget, progress reports are coming up, or no school tomorrow, remember, it's a holiday. Any of those things you can add into that nearby uh, just as another way to communicate because again, a kid that is learning from home that might not be able to attend your Zoom needs to be able to learn from that material. That's the purpose of student pace. Lastly, thinking about grades. Now there are a lot of great ways that you can get many different grades from each individual Nearpod. You can run a Nearpod report and they'll have it stored any quiz that was celebrating. They'll give you a participation grade and you'll be able to look at each individual draw board if you want to assess it that way. I've used reports a lot. It's an easy, quick way to grade, and if you're using Canvas, it appears in your Canvas gradebook. Sometimes the draw tool is hard to see there, so if you're going to be grading that, I would recommend you do the next thing, which is have kids take a screenshot and turn in their work. It is very helpful if you just, at the very start of school, teach your students how to screenshot, because that way, if I just want to grade one board or a couple of boards from the Nearpod, I don't want to have to go in and click on each and every individual one. So I would have them screenshot and turn those things in on Canvas or Google Classroom or Seesaw. Also, they can snap pictures of their work if they prefer to work on it on notebook paper or if you have them make a poster or something at home, they could snap a picture with a camera. Uh, Google Suite. So anything that are, is a Google tool, Google Jamboard, Google um, Docs, Google Sheet, all of those can be linked in using web content tool in Nearpod. So that gives you another Thing. Maybe you're going to tell them, hey, I'm only grading this, which, by the way, I stopped doing. I just told them, I'm grading it all. Here's why. It is so easy to grade this way. So now, kids don't ask if they should do it or not. They have to do it all. And notes just look like another way to assess your learning because they're discovering it while they're taking their notes. Subscribe to my channel and like this video. 